Hello. Um, yeah, welcome. Um, in these early morning hours, uh, after the long party yesterday, uh, it looks a bit more like a workshop than a real huge panel discussion, but uh, welcome. Um, yeah, we are supposed to talk about exploitation chain, uh, about sales, distribution, art market, collecting and conservation, and presentation. Um, my name is Olaf Stümer. Um, all I'm doing is about uh, visual arts and artist film. I used to have a gallery from 2001 to 2011 with a strong emphasis on video art. Uh, I'm creating a program in Berlin, it's called Video Art at Midnight. I'm a published in an art edition and I'm holding lectures at universities and also for Goethe Institute. My guests are on the very to my next um, Renate Buschmann from IMAI. IMA is Intermedia Art Institute Foundation in Düsseldorf, which was founded in 2006 um, and main um, and the main uh, work is distribution and uh, preservation, but Renate will tell us more uh, a bit later. Uh, next to Renate is, uh, uh, my guest, uh, Natalia Ruck, Natalia uh, director of the gallery, Natalia Ruck, which was founded in 2013 in uh, Cologne at the uh, Jupiter Straße. Um, on her gallery's roster are main painter and conceptual artist, when on the side writes, and, um, but she also has a video artist, um, I mean Lei, Lai, um, uh, who she uh, represented in a lot of fairs internationally, such as Nada Affair Miami, uh, Sunday Fair in London, ABC in Berlin, and so on. Um, and last but not least, uh, Markus Hannebauer on the very left side, collector from uh, Berlin. His uh, collection is named Fluentum uh, Collection. He's a software entrepreneur, um, and his collection has a strong focus on uh, time-based media art. Markus started to collect in 2010 at uh, the Loop Fair in Barcelona. This is a fair which is dedicated uh, exclusively for um, to uh, moving image. Um, in his collection, there are meanwhile 50 media <coughs> uh, works. Um, there are names, famous, and, but also young and emerging artists, famous like Uma Fast, Christian Jankowski, Douglas Gordon, or William Kendridge. Recently, he started to actively support uh, selected artists in the production of um, new works. And last but not least, he is a uh, um, donor of the Regionale Award this year and for the next two years, for the next two editions of the... Uh, uh, when we talk about art market, perhaps you allow me to make a very short review about uh, how artists film and video develop in the art market. In the early 1930s, Julian Levy in uh, New York, um, a powerful advocate for um, surrealists like Louis Bonuel, Joseph Cornell, or Marcel Bichon, uh, had the brilliant idea to offer um, limited editions of films to the art market. So he made 60 million of prints of uh, the surrealist um, artists and offered them the limited edition uh, on the art market. That was the very first step in this direction. He was not successful. There is no record that he ever uh, succeeded in selling a single work, but he tried it. Um, the advent of uh, video art in the late 1960s drew an increase, uh, increasing number of artists to the moving image. Uh, very famous and very um, important to mention here is Gerrit Schum. You probably know him all here. Uh, he's from Düsseldorf. He was from Düsseldorf. And he ventured the Fernsehgalerie and the uh, Video Galerie Schum. In the uh, Fernsehgalerie, he showed uh, land art video works in, uh, on the Center of Highest Berlin, SFB, uh, in 1968. Um, it was at midnight after the program of the regular TV program uh, when it stopped. The 
the works of the Fernseh Gallery were shown without any comment. Um, one of the first one was uh, um, Fireplace, something that I uh, don't remember the name. You saw only a fire uh, burning down uh, on the TV and the family was sitting around the fire like uh, in middle age in front of the lacquer fire. And uh, it became problems because um, he, he said, no, he don't want to, be, to have any introduction, he don't want to have any explanation, he want only to show the, uh, the artwork. And then some, there was some point where the TV station said, no, uh, it's not our thing. But there's also the, um, the video gallery soon, um, where he started to sell video artworks also in limited edition but also not successful. He had to stop um, some years later. Um, not his, uh, stop, he actually stopped his life um, due to uh, financial problems, um, it is said. At the same time, in New York, Leo Castelli also tries to sell um, video artworks and films. And together with his wife, uh, Ilona Soland, uh, they um, ventured the company Castelli Sanam Tapes and Films in Corporation, uh, which was uh, the director where Nina Sandel and Joyce Nero. Uh, they also tried to sell, to sell film and video um, to private, but also to institutional collections. Um, in they started in 1968. In 1977, they had to close uh, with $14,000 outstanding bills and with $30,000 owed to artists. Um, so it was also not successful. They gave their um, artwork of this uh, company to Electronic Art Indemix, EAI, and to Vita Data Bank, to distributors. And now we come, um, yeah, no, no, we saw in this history that there are two models actually. One, one model is uh, the gallery system, which tried to sell artworks in limited editions to collections, private and institutional. But also, they were not successful. And also nowadays, a lot of galleries have problems to sell media arts, not you, as you told. Um, and the other model, which we have to, to show to bring uh, video art to public art distribution companies uh, like Iman. And um, that's the point where I give the micro to Renate to uh, tell about the history of Iman here, about uh, 235 uh, media um, and so on. Yeah. Hello to everybody. While I'm talking, I will show you the website of the Iman Foundation, maybe. It makes you, gives you a better understanding of our institution in this very short presentation. Just uh, hang on a minute. Okay. By the, no. by the way, we are a small group. And, and if you have any questions, if you have any questions, please interrupt us as yes. often as uh, you need it, as often as you want. Um, I think it should be a bit uh, exchange if you want. Um, yeah, feel free to interrupt us and to ask us questions. Okay, thank you. So um, actually, the my foundation, which was founded in two thousand six, <coughs> is the result of the commercial market, art market, um, because Emma Foundation was founded for taking care of a rather huge collection of video art that came from a video art distributor. The very first one, the only one here in Germany, um, it was 235 Media, and they were situated, and they are still situated, in Cologne. So in the early 80s, um, two, you know, the two owners, already last night, Axel Wills, they founded this video art distribution because it's more or less at the same time when the video Nala started, because in the 80s, in the middle of the 80s, there was this strong feeling that there should be another kind of art market for video art. So that is because video art in this, um, let's say, it's a democratic, attitude and it can be re 
reproduced in many, many copies, and that it, in a way, it refuses um, to have this uh, to have this understanding of an original. It demanded another kind of market, another kind of um, distribution system. So they developed in those days not only two, three, five media, but a lot of artists and a lot of theoreticians uh, still around, in which uh, who were around in Germany in those days, and uh, many of them coming from the film market, they developed a new system and said, okay, um, it's not only about selling these pieces of video, but it's also about uh, hiring out these pieces. And um, so maybe I should use in this context in your, this expression, which is also the topic of uh, the video novel, perform, because it was, and even today for us, it is not about giving away an original or an edition, uh, a copy of a limited edition, it's also about the performance of the piece, and that should be paid. And therefore, we are the office. So we have this so Ima, the Ima Foundation got the whole collection um, of 235 Media. We cover it, we have uh, several tasks. Our task is, of course, first of all, to preserve this huge collection of video art. Um, a ma majority of these pieces um, is uh, from the 80s and the 90s, so it's really historical. Um, but at the same time, we want to present it, and we want to continue this system of distribution. And that you can see here in this part uh, of our website, it's called Archive and Distribution. So we, you have the possibility, and that is for free of course, to have a look into our archive. Um, it's not everything there in the internet, but um, we are still in the process of improving this website and this database. But you can, of course, do research on the internet. And you see there's this other part of distribution. So for us, it's um, very important that we, according to the agreements with about 150 artists, international, national, and international artists, we can loan these works, but also, of course, we can sell these works to certain conditions to everybody, so to festivals and um, to collections and private uh, collectors and so on. But um, I think the main, and then after that I will stop, <laughs> The main difference to a gallery is um, that we, of course, or let's say that our responsibility towards these works of video art does not stop in the moment when we sell the work. We keep, we maintain them for the future. We have an archive, we have a preservation project, we have a long-term archiving system, and uh, we want to function also in the future as an archive which can present all these works for future activities and presentations. So um, we give it to, to um, all who are interested in, uh, we ask for fees in the case that it, the piece will be loaned for a certain time, but on the other hand we want to, to keep it alive, the work for the future. And maybe one, as one sentence to add, um, what is very important to us is that we can give all these works and load these works for educational purposes. And I think this is another very important, um, important task of our foundation. We want that video art and media art is more present in uh, educational institutions and they have the possibility to enlarge their studies in research and, uh, of course, in lectures um, in, in the moment to come to EMA and to ask for, um, for, for good examples to give lectures. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that Natalia will have uh, answers um, to this. Um, 
the gallery model is actually different. I wouldn't agree in all points what Renata said. Uh, the most difference I see between uh, uh, distributors and galleries are that distributors are more passive. They are more archives where people can go to make research and to load or to uh, rent works. And galleries are more active. And uh, they are more the agents of selected um, artists. Um, but probably uh, you can tell a bit more about the gallery system from your point of view and your experience with, um, um, with video art in the gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, um, one of my artists that I represent is currently at Video Nala, and uh, he's uh, exhibiting two videos and photograph as a presentation. And basically, we've experienced quite success, big success with this work because we decided that um, we will make it easy for people to acquire uh, a video work because it is a complicated or seemingly complicated um, uh, art to collect. So we made quite a large edition, edition of seven plus three P. So we have ten, uh, ten copies basically that we sell. And um, we made uh, quite a lot of price. In the beginning, we sold it for 1,500 know, US dollars. We, we went to, to an art <coughs> And we sold uh, the whole edition because we, the way we exhibited it was very easy to understand. That like anybody could do it. It was a small projector, uh, projected image on the wall, very high resolution. It looked fantastic. And so people wanted to, to have that in their house because you can move it around. It's extremely easy to install. And so we've um, made it, we kind of democratized the process of collecting video. And, um, and so we developed uh, some sort of format, uh, a certificate of authenticity, which um, provides you with instructions how to install and uh, a request to inform the artist or the gallery if the work is uh, lended or um, uh, to an exhibition somewhere else. Uh, as well as another uh, sheet of paper where uh, suggested equipment is provided. So it's very straightforward. There is um, no, not, not necessarily a particularly legal language. It's very sort of easy to grasp. And uh, from then on, we were really successful in placing his works in his collections. And it sort of continued on. And um, we find it very uh, liberating because you know, he loves working with media as well as photography and it's equally as you know equally popular with uh, with the audience and uh, sorry you yeah. so there were with the equipment uh, also with the monitor already with the no. monitor or only the no no, no. Okay. yeah mm -hmm. we, we, we provide links to amazon like where people can buy i mean we made it very very easy okay and even the uh, you know the, the all the the rest of the cords and <laughs> so it was very um, straightforward and people loved it because uh, you can still like, get response and we love work, now it's in our bedroom, you know, and we just moved from the kitchen. So it's very sort of people who live with it as opposed to collect a video world that you can't really show, you have to have this uh, immensely expensive equipment. So we made it fairly simple and uh, I think that's the key in my case it was the key to um, to make this happen in a way and um, the only thing I, I, I have to follow up with people is if, it, if equipment changes because you know projectors come up fairly regularly new, new, new models and so I suggest to uh, collectors to update upgrade whenever they want um, because there are better versions and uh, and so, yeah, so you would agree uh, with Renate that um, your task stops as soon as the work is sold, so you would Not help the customers or the collectors um, also in 10 years, for example, if the uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, resolution changes you know, I mean, or... Well, the advantage is that the artist is quite young, so I'm not dealing with the artwork that's you know, that's not impossible to reproduce without artist agreement, all these things. So the artist can also assist anyone who's interested in, in the upgrading, <coughs> if the file is lost or things like that. So we're very open to these things. It's, it's um, yeah, I'm 
I'm just thankful that people like that. Mm. And how do you see your role? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would actually have a question directly connecting to that because um, also in we were talking about the possibilities of um, preservation and of course I mean that's getting more difficult and more difficult the older the pieces are. Uh, I'm asking that also because <coughs> an activist Bill Texel in Hamburg this um, feminist video art collection and I mean they have these kind of like loads of old machines um, and um, the responsibility of um, upkeeping the material, which is um, a lot of work and uh, also expensive. Um, and um, I, mean, I could also ask this to you, how will you, Andrea, have a, a vision for the future of um, if this gets bigger, how can also the collectors, like these private collectors, then make sure that they can preserve the work, but also um, the question to Renata, how do you actually organize that and how do you get the machines and how do you finance it? Yes. Thank you for this question, but this is uh, the topic for a uh, own lecture, actually. I will make it short. We have a research project right now, and it is financed by um, uh, Lancho Solan Reinhardt, of the Regional Council for Arts and Culture here in this part of Germany, and they finance it for two years. And this is only about uh, long-term archiving, and it's, it is extremely expensive. So in my foundation, I can never afford to do it without these fundings. Um, and we try to digitize um, about 1,500 to 2,000 works in, on three different in three different files and so on. And all this research before, um, it took us a very long time to do it. And um, so this was a point I was uh, trying to underline. I think it's not uh, necessary to, to, to make a difference between a gallery and a distributor. I don't want to stress this. Uh, I just want to say that we really feel that our one of our main part is to do preservation and to make uh, um, our archive ready for the future. And that is maybe another reason why we are not that more passive in the art market. We, we more feel engaged in this way. So um, we have a lot of old, these obsolete machines. We have a look at our tapes. There are many different tapes just of one work. But it's a huge work to do. As you can imagine if we have a VR um, artwork from, let's say, the early 80s, then we have it on Humatic tape. We have it on a, maybe on a Betacam SP. We have it at VHS. We have it all as an additional Betacam version and so on and so far, and then we have to check it again. Because now, right now, we have the responsibility to find out the best copy we can get and to give and to translate this best copy into the new digital files. And this is immense. So we have now, we have a strategy, but it is necessary to keep the contact, to stay in touch with uh, scholars and uh, conservators and curators all over the world um, to keep this going on. This maybe, I hope this answers your questions. I would like to give now the microphone to Markus. The connector is stronger actually connected to the gallery than uh, to the distributor. Um, but anyhow, um, we also make this research at the distributors. Sometimes we talk about the notorious triangle between artists, galleries, and collector, um, because they are so strong uh, together and powerful if they work well together. Um, Marco, tell me, ask a little bit about your start. You were quite, you start quite late, so recently, uh, sorry, recently, um, 2010 at Loop, and uh, yeah. Tell me about the last, or us about the last six years of collecting and uh, how you started and how you developed your collection. I mean, um, uh, as you said, I, I just just started collecting pretty recently, so yeah. six six years ago. And uh, for me, it's a hobby. I have to say that it's a passion, but it's not what I'm earning my money with. So it's a completely different view on on the whole thing, on the works, and the artists, also on the gallery system. Um, 
I started collecting because I always had an interest in, 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 in a certain way in art. I didn't have the time to actually spend much time on it. So at that time, I was pretty active in, in my company. I'm a computer scientist by education, so uh, I had to, to, uh, to grow my, my software company. But in 2010, I noticed that I need something beside the company that actually would provide some content to, to my life outside of outside of my job. And since I always had a certain passion for the visual arts, uh, I, I was invited in 2010 by a befriended gallerist to Loop in Barcelona. This is a dedicated art fair, uh, which is placed in a hotel, and they have 40 hotel rooms on the ground floor, and you can see one, one video piece per room. So you actually go through the hotel and can dedicate a huge amount of time to each piece, which is good. So it's much different from a traditional art fair where you have booth is only 10% is video, if at all. Uh, and this started my interest in the whole topic. And I, I also like the fact that video is, or moving image is a certain, is very similar to software today. And this is uh, where I want to challenge your point because we have a slightly different view on, on video art in that regard. And this is just a time issue. It's, it's about when the art has been created. So for me, a video is this piece of software that's on disk. And what you actually buy is not the disk, it's not the box, it's not the USB stick or anything. It's just a bunch of rights. And this is very close to my business because I, I know that the software that's on the disk is not the real product. The product is the usage rights, the presentation rights. And this is what I, this is what I understand well. And this is, I think, what many collectors, at least over the past two decades, have easily understood that you're actually buying rights. Um, and I'm, I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty convinced that you did a great job in, in simply commodifying this process because many people didn't understand what a video piece really is. So it was two difficulty, uh, uh, difficulties in the past where people don't understand what a video piece is uh, from a collectible perspective, and there was also this, this problem of presenting it, so from a technical perspective. And I think what I, what I want to challenge is that today, I mean, we often have these discussions and we often have people in the room that, that care about archiving, about preserving, and, and then the, the, the popular impression from these panels is that collecting video art is really complicated, and it's not. And, and the, the, the reason is that if you start collecting today, you won't take care, if you are not collecting historical pieces, you won't have to care about tapes. You won't have to care about special machines. Um, you, don't, you usually don't care about Hunter X Q monitors anymore. You can, if you want to, but you don't have to. So today, I think the whole collecting of video art is much more accessible. Uh, you have up-to-date file formats that you update every 10 years. This is completely doable with free software. And you have equipment that's easily available from, from Amazon. And, and what I, what my point is, is if you want to start collecting video or if you're interested in video, don't get, don't concern yourself too much about how to preserve it, but start doing it. And then you will see how, how you can drive your collection or your interest in the arts um, into a way that is doable for you that don't need a huge institution behind. Of course, it's important to have institutions and galleries like yours uh, for, for many aspects of the whole thing, but if I'm looking at it as a private collector, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy that it's much easier to collect video than anything else. Um, and a good I reason? Uh, yes, sorry. I, I don't have any numbers, but I'm actually doubting whether the most most of the people are working with free software. And I'm uh, mentioning Amazon again and again and again. We are in the field of huge, huge um, capitalist uh, economy. Um, and also kind of like buying um, digital rights today is not like this. <laughs> um, no, I'm not talking um, about that. The artwork. Kind of like, uh, I'm not saying that the artwork, artwork is for free. Not, not no, 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 I know. But also, kind of like, if you start collecting today mm -hmm. digital um, rights, you are kind of like becoming part of the um, capitalist uh, part of the artwork. It's not kind of like you are in oh, this yeah, um, that's, that's a different question. area and the question of 
um, preservation is, um, I mean, of course, we were also dependent on the development of the hardware um, in order to preserve the files. I mean, kind of like in 10 years, we need another computer and another um, hardware system in order to um, be able to still present. Yeah, I, I can only talk about myself, you know, I'm not that much into, into discussing other people's concerns in that regard. Um, so for my view, it's, it's I'm a part of a capitalized system, I don't know. I'm simply interested in... in Actually, we all, we all are part of a capitalist <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. system. <laughs> the whole art market is a capital system, and the gallery works as a capital system, and also oh, the distributor, but in the end, it's, it's about selling, and it's uh, and uh, purchasing, and it's about rights in the end. Uh, if uh, um, IMAE gives a video for loan, they also have a contract. Um, and if a gallery sells an artwork, uh, they have a contract or a certificate. Um, and they actually they sell, as Marco said, a bunch of, of rights. The rights to show the work, to show the, to show the work in public, to transfer, for example, the archival copy on another media, and in the end to uh, the rights to sell, to resell the work. So, and you have to deal with it. And this deal is uh, actually uh, it's our rights and our contracts. And so, it's a kind of capital system. Uh, I'm not doubting that we are all part of the capitalist system. I'm saying um, let's recognize that people are differently positioned within this system. And maybe also, in fact, if you look at artists and the position that they have in uh, or Artists, it's also not have like one big group, but there are artists who are um, on the upper level of the market than artists who are, um, from a capitalist point of view, not those who can actually define the conditions, how their rights are. Um, yeah, but, so there, but for example, Billy Campbell's and Bill Künstler, they give courses, or um, I'm also coach, coach at the BBK, and artists can come to me and I explain them. And also, there are a lot of uh, young and emerging artists, not established one, and also they have to look for their rights. If they sell from out of their studio an artwork, a video work, of course, they, they, are, they have to uh, look for their rights even more than uh, the uh, real one because uh, they have dealers and uh, lawyers behind them, but, uh, but an artist from the studio, he must beware of his, his rights. So, but um, when we talk about rights and certificate, now we come again back to um, Latanya Hook. Um, you said you tried to make very easy and uh, simple for the purchaser and for the whole system and you develop an own yeah. Contract or something you wanted to show it? Um, we, well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's basically a template we developed. But um, to, to answer your question, we talk about distribution and, and sales of media art. That's on the premises that the artist agrees to work with a gallery or a collector. So this is kind of irrelevant in a way, in terms of somebody not having the opportunity to preserve because the collector buys, he already agrees or knows that there will be some kind of an investment in preservation or um, uh, so in terms of so I can pass it around but it's very it's a very simple thing there are two pages and um, it has an image still image of the uh, of the video and basically we we developed that two years ago so or, or almost three years ago so it's it's the end two thousand fifteen actually four years ago. <laughs> And, um, but, there, but actually, there are a lot of discussions about these contract things, right things. Uh, there recently uh, was published a book at Moose uh, magazine. Uh, I knew somebody. Uh, what, do you remember the, the title of the book? I bought a video once. Yeah, I knew somebody who knows somebody who bought a video once, <laughs> and that, there was uh, all the problems that people had. Um, with purchasing video art, uh, the huge uh, essay by um, Alain Saber, a collector from Belgium, who uh, told about his problems with Ken William Kendridge and all these things. Uh, so there's a lot of um, there are a lot of forces to uh, to try to make a kind of standard. And uh, the Look Fair, we heard about the Look Fair in Barcelona, and they developed together with uh, lawyers and with uh, participants of the art market, also museums. A kind of um, 
standard uh, protocol. They call it Zoop protocol. Um, I can show it if you want. Um, You probably know this, uh, the standard contracts from renting uh, apartments, um, you can buy them in a normal Schreibwarenladen uh, and uh, something like this they tried uh, to develop uh, because there are a lot of, uh, because there are a lot of uh, different certificates and different uh, um, contracts um, which connect us at the first. One of the first one was uh, some goods in Munich. Um, they tried to make their own um, contract with the artist and installation uh, protocol. And this loop tried to uh, simplify. Uh, also, Markus um, had his own one. Um, I have here somewhere as well, only to see the crowd of lights. You see here. Perhaps you want to tell something to it? Yeah. Marcus? Yeah. The re the reason for the reason for this document was that actually I found out not pretty late, but I think three years ago, uh, when trying to set up a web page where you have an online catalog of all the works, uh, be shown that I wanted something more than what's usually in the certificate, uh, because if, if you have a gallery that only works with the certificate. Uh, the only, the only, the, the major part of the certificate is actually that it, uh, it, it gives you the, um, um, it ensures you that the work you have bought is actually by the artist. So it's more or less a, it's a certificate of, um, of authorship that the, that the artist provides. This is all. Uh, if, you, if you have nothing else in the certificate, that it's simply the signature on the painting. It doesn't mean that you have the painting. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are supposed to show the painting to borrow it to an institution or that you have the right to sell it. And often people mix this in the certificate, but often it's simply missing. So you, even, even with, a, with a more established artist, it's simply not there. And that was the reason why I started this. It's a, this is a one-pager. And it says to the artist what I would like to see from him or her uh, when they sell a work to, to my collection. And it's, it's actually only five points, more or less. Uh, the first one is the right to present the artwork, uh, either in private or in public. Of course, I can only show it in public once. So it's like a real... Um, the person made it out of work that can be only shown at a single place and a single time in a certain location. I cannot show it in two institutions at the same time. Uh, the second one is the global right to advertise uh, public presentations, for example, by using stills from the artwork or by even using a 30 second excerpt, excerpt uh, from the artwork uh, in a catalog, for example. The third one is the right to copy and re-encode the master copy to just to preserve the work in a way to, to uh, facilitate my rights from this license grant. And the fourth is the right to sell and transfer. Um, and the fifth is the right to assign the above mentioned rights to anyone else I wish to. Meaning that I can simply, for example, donate the work to someone without the express, the express um, allowance by the, uh, by the author. And the rest is also pretty important that, that actually the, the creator of the artwork represents that, that she can grant the above mentioned rights because it might be that the rights are simply not with the author anymore. And this is it. So it's actually very simple. And I didn't have any problems in getting it signed because it's, it's fair, it's not, it's not about... Sometimes the artists want to know whom I'm selling to, which is fine. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's important to have that because otherwise 
you don't even have the right to show stills on your website about the artwork. Because the author, the, the artist can always say, well, it's my copyright, you didn't buy the copyright, of course you can't buy it, but you didn't receive the right to show stills. And this happens. Um, and, and that's the reason why I introduced this, and now the collection is more or less completely covered by, by this set of rights. And for example, if you want to, to lend a piece to someone else, then I can reassure these institutions that I have the right to do this. And they're not getting into problems with the author or with the artist uh, by showing the piece, because then they can always recur to my wrong license and then ensure them that everything will go fine. Uh, but the uh, artwork does not exist only as rights, also physical thing. Uh, collectors want to have something in their hands. They want to carry something home. They don't want to have only a link with a password. Um, so galleries have also different models, how they, what they provide to the collector. Natalia, what do you give the collector? What does they take home? Oh, well, uh, Alvin, Alvin developed um, a system. So we we order uh, a cardboard box, quite quite nice, and it's quite large. In fact, I mean it's a four size. It looks like a book, so you can actually put it on the shelf. And when you open it, there is a like a tiny little carving in with a USB stick, and there's a certificate uh, on the top, and it looks. Quite nice and professional, and people love it. It's okay. really good. So and it's an object. On this USB stick, what is on the USB stick then? The, the video. The video, only one um, yeah. um, format. Yeah, so um, we talked about it as actually we have some kind of a, a matter, you know, some of the different format means that it's, it's pretty much the same no matter what. So you just have it on your hard drive, or, you know, collectors can make copies, of course, it's yeah. uh, written on yeah. the certificate of authenticity, you know, yeah. can do that. And so, in a way, that, that's an object. Yeah. 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 I know also other models where then uh, there's also hard drive for bigger works um, with a ProRes file, which is the most common. Um, archival file, which artists use. Um, um, sometimes there are also DVDs or Blu-rays in it for installation. Um, so there are different ways, but you get something physical and yeah. more and more beautiful things. And I don't know if from Sven Jone, um, he makes uh, hands by hand his, his boxes and sometimes there are photo works in it or even drawings. Um, because, yeah, that's, but even museums, not only the private collectors, even the museums uh, want to have something in their hands of all their archives. There's a question. Yes. Um I want to pick up on that notion uh, that was mentioned about the art market um, because I was I was just thinking about uh, a quote by Peter Weibel who said that video art um, is a very democratic art and it has uh, the the power to escape uh, from the traditional art market since product is not is not a product as such and it can be copied and so on. And I just want to ask because uh, what you are describing in a way is um, to make video art to a kind of a artwork which can be bought. There are strategies you describe as a gallery or as a collector to make uh, this uh, video art somehow um, sellable. And um, on the other hand, how uh, art has developed in the 20th century, this notion of freedom, artistic freedom, uh, because it can be copied and uh, video art can be set on YouTube and so on. So you escape the kind of traditional art distribution selling system was a big hope. Um, Perhaps uh, the same from when this quote is? This quote actually was a few years ago, Peter Weiber was in a talk and he said... Uh, uh, but I think this quote is much, much older. Yeah. Uh, that's from 1968 or something. Because in the very beginning, video art actually was something against art markets. Uh, the artists didn't want to be part of the art markets. They were came from fluxes, from uh, performance art, and they were not interested in the art market at all. But Peter Weibel is a very good example because uh, he is part of the art market and he sells his artwork in limited editions 
very expensive for you while. So all these the video artists changed their, their minds uh, more or less and they were beat, were taken by the art market in the capital system. But yes, Renan has sorry, also I just an answer. To right? say another point. Sorry. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Of course. Uh, uh, performance art. I just wanted to say uh, or to ask the collector and the gallery and the distributor. In a way, both worlds are out. The art market on the one hand and uh, the art market for video art and this notion of free distribution mm -hmm. and how do you keep both worlds up because in a way you keep both worlds up no. yeah may, may I answer? okay um so you're absolutely right also this um, area of the vr distribution distributor in a way is old-fashioned and we know that because um, today with, um, in the area of the internet you can copy and you can show your art everywhere and in every second. So I think I'm, I'm very happy for all this engagement um, in, the, in the field of developing such contracts and agreements because this is very important for us and this um, aspect which I would like to stress now about the materiality of video art. We are always in this process of a shifting materiality and this is a very big um, deal with video art. So uh, I, I wouldn't agree that all the historical video artists really were against the art market. I think they were just looking for another system and they thought and they, then they were happy when they were developed, they could develop this new system of the distributors because this was a way in between, between the art market but also not, and, and this notion and maybe illusion that art can, could be uh, democratic. And it is really interesting that we still, at EMAR Foundation, we we'll still keep a lot of agreements with um, artists coming from those years um, about unlimited editions. Um, and um, of course, we are always in a big discussion with these artists. And some of them, but only a few, decided to change these agreements. The majority of these artists, such as um, Klaus von uh, Hoch, Marcel Odenbach and so on, they decided that they want to keep these unlimited editions and uh, those copies when we sell them they really have a, a small price, they are very cheap. But they want to keep this notion of the democratization of oh, the new ones, not the new ones. Yes, exactly. Yes. And I have to, to add this now. And then when of course contemporary younger artists um, enter the email foundation and the distribution system, we always has, have this discussion. And they want to limit it very, very small. They say to me, even when they just uh, came out from a uh, academy, they say, tell me, well, three maybe. I always say, no, think about your future. I mean, you never know what will happen. Uh, I cannot recommend it to you. Um, so we try, of course, we limit also the new video works, but we try to have it in a higher edition. And I also recommend to these young artists that they should have both a gallery, which really cares for them, which are really their, their partners, and a distributor. Because the distributor can, I think, add other fields and can open up other fields, and not only private collectors, which are, who are really important, but also, um, let's say, festivals and educational institutions. So we, in a way, the distributor, to come back to your question, we try to keep this um, very early, maybe old-fashioned um, idea of democratization, but it's really hard and uh, we wouldn't do our job if we just would stick to it. We have to open up to uh, the reality of the art market and also uh, to the demands of young artists, of course. 
Um, I, would, uh, I, I would actually like to drive the decision more to the beginning of the whole, I don't, know, I don't like the word exploitation chain, I think, but we'll keep it like that, to the beginning of the whole chain where the actual production starts. And if you're going to ask some questions about the end, uh, whether it should be a distribution system, a gallery system, whether it should be for free on Vimeo or on YouTube or whatever, that you can of course ask these questions, but you have to start thinking about the beginning of a work. And today, producing video work is not that cheap. It's different from the years before, where you simply have a, a handheld camera and then walk through a room. Um, today, even the, the, the simplest works often cost uh, five-digit numbers. And, and these, these production costs have to be covered somehow. Um, so even if the artist uh, is not going to earn anything from the artwork, uh, she still has to cover the production costs. And the question is, when is these, how, how, to monitor, how to actually bring back the production costs? It could either be a grant that you don't have to repay, uh, but of course there is not so much grants in Germany at least, um, or you can go to a gallery and find, find some prepaid money, get some prepaid money for production, or you can go to, a, to an institution um, but, but sometimes it's also the collector that actually starts producing stuff. And this is, this is what I did in the, in the past few years. And the simple reason is that uh, artists come to me and ask for funding for new film. And, um, and it makes perfect sense. Uh, because, uh, as I said, doing such a work has become more and more ambitious from a technical perspective. Uh, and people need actors, post-production, color grading, whatever. It takes a lot of money. And so people, when, when doing, when creating and producing artwork, have to think the whole chain through at the beginning, because otherwise they don't, don't get the money to actually do the work. And that's the reason why, why I think uh, people think differently now about the number of editions and how to monetize on the whole uh, work product. That's also, also an argument for, for uh, limitation. Um, that the one brings the money into an artwork wants to have the money back. It's much easier to sell five copies for 10,000 euro than 10,000 copies for five euro in the artwork. Um, I'm sure about it. Uh, and everybody who's part of the art market will, I think, agree. Um, but of course, uh, when we talk about limitation, um, there are pros and contrasts, and so I think the distribution of what you uh, showed that the, the, the art system works with limitation, limited works, and then there's the distribution who gives the rights to a broader audience, that there's a visibility there or left. Um, I think it's very important, um, because the visibility of an artwork um, that everybody can see it, um, is important um, for, um, for educational, um, things, but um, for science studies, teachings, um, but also for the historical discourse. Um, and it's only a copy of three, for example, and they uh, <coughs> disappear in private collections, then they are invisible, and uh, they don't exist anymore, and that's a, it's a problem. Uh, so, there was another question, last question, right? because we uh, have to close already. Yeah? Last question? Yes. Or <laughs> perhaps it was another one then. Uh, uh, only one sentence. I think, this is a view in the future, I think, uh, personally, I think that the only license which will work with art, uh, video art, will be the Creative Commons license, CC. That's my opinion. In the next 20 years. <laughs> Okay. That's cool. Any hope for I mean, the Creative Commons license is a, 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 good, a good starting point for disseminating uh, images that should be free from the beginning on, right? Something that Wikipedia wouldn't work without. But there would be no content in Wikipedia if we wouldn't have the Creative Commons license. Um, and that's, that's a big point. But as I said, you have to think from the beginning. And people have to eat and people have to pay the cameraman, and the question is, who's going to pay for them? And, and, and if, you, if you answer that question, and there's a good, maybe we, may, we will commodify the production process of the art in the near future, and then that will happen. 
as long as we don't have a commodified source of money for producing artwork, or people simply do it for free, uh, then the system won't change. It's similar to the cooking. There are no license in the cooking art to make. And in sports, too. But I think it could be also about uh, this similar to music. <coughs> Uh, that you don't have any kind of free license. Every piece which is published, uh, you can hear it uh, at the radio, is there is uh, a, pay to be, a fee to be paid. So I think I would um, rather stress the other point to say we have to think in performance of video art. Uh, when there is not a, a unique owner of piece, uh, and we distribute it, then all, everybody who is responsible, who is responsible for festival, for theater, um, for any kind of event, should know about uh, the, should know how important it is to pay a fee. And right now, uh, sometimes we really try to publish this and we would try to spread our opinion that also the creators should know in the case they, they get somewhere a copy, a file of a media piece, they do not have always the presentation rights. And um, I think it's necessary to spread this knowledge around. Um. Yeah, of course, one hour is very short uh, for this huge discussion. Uh, Next time we make a day or one day um, talk about it. Um, thank you for your interest. Um, thank you for your contribution. Um, yeah, enjoy the day. Thank you.